Welcome to Hot Chips 23. Session 5. Miscellaneous. We'll go straight to our next session, which is the miscellaneous session. Um, we have a couple of unique presentations here I think you'll find interesting. Uh, the first one is presented by Jim Demmel, and he'll be talking about how we can reduce communication requirements between threads at more of an algorithmic level and to take better advantage of all these MP platforms we've been seeing today. So Jim is a professor of computer science and mathematics at UC Berkeley. And he's also a faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. His work on numerical methods have earned several awards, including National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, IEEE Sydney Finbach Award, J.H. Wilkinson Prize in Numerical Analysis, and the SIAM SIAG Prize Linear Algebra twice. Um, but possibly, actually, the most impressive credential is that if you Google parallel computing course, James's courses pop up as uh, hit number one, hit number two. So uh, with that, I'll have James come up here. Testing, testing, okay. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about a small project with a few close friends. If I can get it to go to the next slide. All right, I'm pushing the button, but it's not going. There we go. As I said, a small project with a few close friends uh, scattered around the world, and we have lots of support from lots of different companies and national agencies. So I'm gonna, the next two slides are motivation that should be very familiar to this audience. Algorithms have two costs, whether you measure them in time or energy, the arithmetic that they do, and the communication, which means moving data. And I'm interested in minimizing that, whether it's moving data between levels of memory hierarchy, between all the different levels that may exist, or between moving data between processors over a network. So my model to say whether I actually have an optimal algorithm, which I will, is that I'm going to count three terms in my algorithms. I'm going to count the number of flops they do, floating point operations. I'm going to count the number of words moved between wherever parts of the machine. And I'm going to count the number of messages into which those words are packed because there's a latency cost associated with each message. And the last two terms are communication. And of course, when I count them, they're going to be proportional to the time per flop, the reciprocal bandwidth, and the latency. And as this audience well knows, all of those coefficients are orders of magnitude apart. Flops are much, much faster than the reciprocal bandwidth. And this is very old data, but they're growing apart exponentially. These are technology trends. This is a very old NRC report from 2004, but you can see they're all growing apart rather rapidly. And so if, even if your algorithm is not communication bound today, it might be next year. So our goal is to reorganize all algorithms that we know of to avoid communication, to do provably as little data movement as possible between all different levels of the memory hierarchy, you know, between processors over a network. And there are very, very large speed ups possible. And I'm concentrating on time, but since moving data also costs more energy, you could think of this as also minimizing energy. So you don't have to believe me that this is important. Here's someone at a higher pay scale. So uh, if, if you read President Obama's budget request to the, uh, for the Department of Energy Research, he cites on modern computer architectures, communication between processors you know, takes a lot longer than floating point. And there are new algorithms that minimize communication between processors uh, if, you re if you do it right. And he doesn't say exactly which papers he's referring to, but there are a couple of papers that, that our group worked on and that are being incorporated into this Trilinos library at the Department of Energy. Okay, 
So here's the outline for the talk. So I'm going to talk about two things. The first one is direct linear algebra, basically anything that smells like three nested loops. And your intuition is perfectly good about what that means. And so I'm going to present lower bounds on communication for doing anything that smells like three nested loops. Matrix multiply, of course, but also solving systems of linear equations, least squares problems, eigenvalue problems, singular value decomposition, all of that. Now, it's natural to ask, do the standard algorithms and the standard libraries, which I also help write, LAPAC and ScalaPAC, do they actually attain those lower bounds? And the answer is no. They do asymptotically more communication than they had to. So we've been busy inventing new algorithms over the last few years that are asymptotically faster than all the standard algorithms that you know of. And they're very large speedups possible that I'll tell you about. So then the, the thing that might most interest this audience is that our new uh, models of these algorithms give you rules for architectural scaling. How do the flop rates, the bandwidths, the latencies, and the memory sizes of a processor have to be related to maintain balance so that you're spending most of your time doing flops? And then I'll tell you the same story for iterative linear algebra, and that's sort of anything where you're doing a sparse matrix vector multiply, and that's where the, what's in the inner loop. Okay, so here's the lower bound. That's true for all, anything that smells like three nested loops. Uh, I'm going to let M be the fast memory size, so you can think of it as the cache as opposed to the DRAM, or your local memory as opposed to the remote memory in a parallel processor, whatever you want to think about it as. So then then the, the number of words that that processor has to move in and out of its fast memory is bounded below by some constant, I won't go into the details, of how many floating point operations it's, it does divided by the square root of its fast memory size. Okay? So I, I won't try to prove that, but that's sort of a lower bound that we want to aim for. And in the parallel case, just think of everything being load balanced. Each processor either has one piece of the work or one piece of the data and apply that formula. Now, I also want to lower bound on the number of messages. OK, sorry, before I get to that, I want to say this holds for matrix multiply. That's been known for 30 years. And what's new is it holds for just about everything that people do. It holds for the basic linear algebra subroutines, which is a lot of things that are like matrix multiply. It holds for solving AX equal B using Gaussian elimination for least squares problems, for eigenvalue problems, for SVDs, tensors. It holds for whole programs where you, you, know, you call sequences of these things. No matter how you interleave them, you get these lower bounds. It's true for both dense and sparse matrices. The flops don't have to be n cube. Even if you're doing sparse matrix multiply, this lower bound applies. It applies in the sequential and the parallel case, and it also applies to some graph theoretic algorithms. You're not doing multiplies and adds anymore, but it's still three nested loops. So, so that's the lower bound on the number of words moved. I also want a lower bound on the number of messages sent. And that's pretty easy. You take the number of words moved and you divide by the largest message size. Now, depending on your architecture, you, know, you may have different largest message sizes. But just to keep this talk simple, I'm going to use a largest message size that's always true and is actually makes sense in the distributed memory case. The largest message size is your local memory. So I'm just going to say divide that by m for the sake of you know, keeping this talk simple. You could use your own you know, cache block size if you want. OK, so armed with those lower bounds, the natural thing to do is go back all the libraries we've been writing for many years and ask, do those algorithms attain the lower bounds? And hardly any of them do. I mean, matrix multiplying, you know, we've known that a long time. But almost everything else does asymptotically more than necessary. So we've been in busy inventing over the last few years new algorithms for, most, for all of, of linear algebra that do attain these lower bounds. And they're new algorithms in the sense that they're, they're new numerical properties, new ways to encode the answers, new data structures. I mean, they're really new algorithms. They're not just loop transformations. And we've done, we're also working on the sparse case, like sparse Gauss elimination, but that's harder. Only a little bit of progress. So let me give you an example of one algorithm. I mean, I don't want to go into too much algebra, but I'm just going to give you one example to show you how the algorithm varies as a function of your architecture in order to minimize communication. So suppose, so if you remember the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process from sophomore linear algebra, this, is, this computes the same thing, but faster. So I'm given a, a, a matrix with a lot of rows and just a few columns, call it W, and I want to factor it into a Q matrix with orthogonal columns times an R matrix, a little upper triangle. And so let's suppose four processors own the matrix. Each processor owns a quarter of the rows. How am I going to do it? I'm going to start by each processor with no communication at all runs the classical algorithm and computes a local factorization of Q times R. Now, why do I bother doing that? What I've implicitly done is I've computed, I factored my original matrix W as a product of a Q, Q matrix and a stack of four little triangles. So I want one triangle, not four, but I've made some progress. No communication yet. 
The next step, I take that stack of four triangles, take them a pair at a time. Now every processor just talks to its neighbor once. And now I get those pair of triangles and I reduce them again just to one triangle, an ortho a new Q and a new orthogonal matrix, a new triangle. And again, it, that's implicitly that matrix times that matrix. Now I have one more stack of just two triangles. I went from four to two, I want one. So I'll do the same trick, do one more factorization, call this little algorithm. And what I've implicitly done is factored my matrix W into the product of that, times that, times that, times R. That's the answer. It's a totally different representation than it was before. It's implicitly output is just this list of matrices, but everything that you ever wanted to do with it mathematically, you can do with this new representation, only it's a lot faster. So, so let me just sort of draw a, a, the simplest picture of what that algorithm is. This is a parallel case. Every processor owned a quarter of the rows, and I basically did a reduction. Everybody, I just did tree reduction, and the tree reduction operation is this little QR algorithm, and out pops R at the end. That's the parallel algorithm, and it minimizes communication. Well, what about a sequential machine? It's the same algorithm, I'm just going to use a different tree. So suppose now <clears throat> I'm on a sequential machine, but I can only fit a quarter of the matrix into cache at a time. So I bring in the first quarter of the matrix, do QR, bring in the next quarter of the matrix, stack them up, do QR, and I can do the whole operation. I read the matrix from memory once. I can't read it any fewer times than once. So, so what about dual core? I might have a different tree like that to take into account there's off-chip communication and inter-chip communication. But what if I have a real computer? You know, it's a multi-core, multi-socket, multi-rack, multi-site, et cetera. What am I going to do? I'm just going to pick a different reduction tree, and I'll choose it dynamically depending on what hardware resources I have. I get a different output, but it will provably minimize communication. So, how much faster do we go? Here are a few speed up numbers. 8x compared to the last best thing on a Cloverton, <clears throat> 6.7 on a Pentium cluster, 4x on a Blue Jean, 13x on a Fermi. That 4x on a grid, that's a grid of four French cities. You can imagine how long it takes to move data between French cities. And it gets 4x speed up over one city. And we have it up and running on a cloud, but we don't really know what the data means yet. It's kind of hard to get repeatable data on a cloud. And in the sequential case, we got infinite speed up. What's that mean? You run the conventional algorithm, and it thrashes the disk for so long we gave up waiting. But if you run the new algorithm, it only runs twice as slow as though you had an infinite DRAM. So that's, that's a good speed up, too. OK, so let me give you a model of a future machine. You may know that the Department of Energy is trying to build a supercomputer, an exascale computer, a 10 to the 18th floating point operation per second computer in 2018. And there's a committee working on all the hardware parameters, and this is what they think it's going to look like. And I'm not going to walk through all of it. So the question is, what algorithm will work best on this? And I should say the Department of Energy also wants it to run in 20 megawatts, but I'm not sure that's possible. But let me just use those parameters and write a model of how fast these algorithms are going to run. So here is a picture of a prediction of how fast our new Gaussian elimination algorithm will run, how many times faster it is than the classical one that's currently in use. And I'd sort of, in the horizontal axis is the log of the number of processors up to a million, because that's how big the machine is. The vertical axis is the log of how much memory you use per processor, and it's color-coded by speed up. Now, at the top of the plot, you fill up your whole memory. That's the land of the LINPACK benchmark. It's totally compute-bound. Communication is, is irrelevant. We don't get any speed up. But if you have a relatively small matrix and you're doing strong scaling, it's predicting 29 times faster, because that's how much less communication we're doing, right? So, that's, so this is Im important stuff when your problems are small enough and you want to throw a large number of processors at it to go very fast, then it becomes communication bound. So, so the next question we asked ourselves is, are we really using all the hardware resources available to us? Right? We, we have this lower bound, and then the denominator of the lower bound is how much memory you use per processor. Okay? And the usual way we do things in this business is that you know, everybody gets one piece of the data, and so the memory per processor is n squared, because it's an n by n matrix divided by p. And that gives us, plug it in, you get these particular lower bounds. And these are the ones that get attained. And these are called two-dimensional algorithms, because the processor topology is everybody's connected in a two-dimensional mesh, a square root of p by square root of p mesh. But you know, if I have a small problem, I'm not using very much memory here. So then we asked ourselves, well, let me use all the memory. Can I reduce communication? You know, why would I believe that's possible? Because if I increase the, the matrix, the local memory size, my lower bound gets smaller. It doesn't tell me I can attain it, but it gives me hope that maybe there's a clever algorithm that will get this, to this new lower bound. 
And we, we, we went and we discovered there are new algorithms that are asymptotically faster than even standard matrix multiplication if you use all the memory that's available to you. They communicate less. So let me show you some data here. So this is just a summary of what we're going to do. I'm going to compare the classical matrix multiply uh, using a two-dimensional mesh of processors, and, but there's only one copy of all the inputs and all the outputs. And I'm going to compare that to the new algorithm where I have enough memory to have C copies. And that could be two or three or four, whatever is available to you. And I'm going to uh, show you speed up numbers here. And so this is a, a 64K by 64K matrix multiply on an IBM BGP at Argonne National Lab. Here's the number of nodes. Each node is a multi-core chip. And the vertical axis is percent of machine peak. So 100% is at the top. And here's scale pack And you can see that this problem fits on 256 processors, but as you keep adding processors, it gets slower and slower because it becomes communication bound. And this perfectly horizontal line at the top, perfect scaling, that's the new algorithm. It, it scales perfectly, strong scaling. The communication costs go down proportionally to the number of processors, so that's as good as you're going to get. So, so here is some, is some more data. Oh, I should say, to get this to work, we had to be very careful about using the 3D inter torus interconnect and the IBM BGP. Every wire of that torus was busy. That had to be done very carefully. We tried to get this to run on a Cray, which has a different kind of network, didn't work. You need the three-dimensional torus interconnect. OK, here is the same story for Gaussian elimination. A little bit too much data here. So I'm going to compare the two dimensions. So this is, again, a really big matrix, well, 128K. I'm going to run Gaussian elimination. And I'm going to have 16,000 processors. And I'm going to compare the two-dimensional algorithm. There's the time. And here's the new algorithm. And I've broken it down into how much time do I spend communicating, how much time do I spend idle, and how much time do I spend computing. And the communication time reduced by a factor uh, by 86%. That's how much it went away. And the idle time got a lot better, too. So the overall speed up is like a factor of two. But if this is energy, I got rid of a lot of the energy. And oh, I should say this won a Distinguished Paper Award, uh, or will will it, at Europar, and, but all these performance data will appear in Supercomputing 11. OK, so now, what are the implications for architectural scaling? So what does your machine have to, what rules does it have to obey in order to be compute bound and not communication bound if you use the right algorithms? So I'm going to sort of state these rules in terms of seconds per flop, the reciprocal bandwidth, the latency, the local memory size, and the number of processors. So I want to know a relationship between all these things that will guarantee that you'll spend you know, most of your time doing flops. And there's going to be one page for the sequential case and one for the parallel case. So I want to make sure that I'm going to do, so this is the rule that says if you want to spend more time doing flops than the bandwidth costs, then the time per flop times the square root of your local memory size should be at least the reciprocal bandwidth. What does that mean in words? That means the time to take to add two rows of your largest locally storable matrix is bigger than the reciprocal bandwidth. That's just what the, the math tells you. And if you don't want to be, if you don't want to be latency bound, then this is the rule. Time per flop times your local memory size to the three halves power should be bigger than the latency. And in words, that means take the two largest square matrices you can store locally Multiplying them should take longer than the latency of a single message. And this applies to every level of the memory hierarchy. That's if you use the new algorithms. And if you use the old algorithms, you get other rules, but they're harder to satisfy, right? So the new algorithms make your architecture more scalable. There's a similar slide. And I had hoped by today to actually get a big spreadsheet of, his of historical data, values of gamma, m, and beta for lots of old machines, and show you pictures, like Moore's Law, but I didn't get all the data in time. So, but you, know, you shouldn't be surprised. Most machines do matrix multiply at pretty fast speeds. And, and so these uh, in, inequalities are satisfied. So here are the rules in the parallel case. So if I, want, if I have p processors, I want to do n by n linear algebra on them. Gamma is the time per flop. Beta is the network reciprocal bandwidth. Alpha is the network latency. Here's the rule that has to be satisfied to make sure you're not bandwidth bound. Here's the rule that has to be satisfied to make sure you're not latency bound. These are the new algorithms. Here are the, here's the old algorithm. It's much harder to satisfy the latency bound than it was before. We reduced the latency a lot. And if you're willing to use all the local memory and use these new algorithms with redundant copies, those are the uh, ar architectural scaling rules. And they're much easier to satisfy. For small matrices, you can scale much better. And we saw that in the performance plot. 
Okay. So let me summarize the first part of the talk. For direct linear algebra, anything that smells like three nested loops, we have new lower bounds, optimal algorithms, and big speed ups in both theory and practice. Um, there's lots of work going on in this. You might say, well, what about heterogeneous architectures, you know, mixtures of CPUs and GPUs? Well, the theory all applies. That lower bound that I said, you can do it processor by processor. They can all have different bandwidths and latencies and memory sizes, and you can get lower bounds for heterogeneous machines. And we're in the process of trying to attain them by new optimal algorithms. Uh, so there's lots more algorithmic invention going on. If you've heard about Strassen's method, it does this stuff faster than n cubed, n to the 2.81. We can extend all the lower bounds to those kinds of algorithms as well, and that won another best paper award recently. So, so this new algorithm design space is pretty complicated. I mean, this theory obvious, obviously does not capture all the details of an architecture, but it's enough for us to sort of design new algorithms. But to find the best algorithm, which is, of course, what we want, what we do is we do auto-tuning. We generate a search space of different algorithms that are probably, you know, that, that all are, you know, satisfy our requirements, but we don't know exactly what all the block sizes are and all the parameters, and we just search for the best ones. And that, that's been widely used for a number of years to generate very fast libraries, and we're using it here as well. So that's the end of direct linear algebra. And now I'm going to tell you a similar story, in, in a sense, new algorithms that are much, much faster, in not nearly as much detail, since I only have seven minutes and 16 seconds left, about iterative linear algebra. So what do these algorithms look like? I want to solve a linear system where I want to find eigenvalues. And what does the algorithm look like? There's a loop, and in the loop I do a sparse matrix vector multiply, SPMV, with, with a matrix A and a starting vector. I generate lots and lots of vectors, and then I take some linear combination of them as my answer. So these are widely used conjugate gradient method. There, there, there are lots of names. And so the big cost is a sparse matrix vector multiply because you only get to do two flops per matrix entry. That's totally memory bound. And so these are much, much harder to make go fast. And so my goal is to minimize communication, to do much less data movement than the obvious implementation. And so I'm going to assume, to get this to work, that my matrix is well partitioned. So think you know, matrices from finite element analysis, you know, so stuff like that. So, the, so here's what we can do in the serial case. So in, this, in the serial loop, what am I doing? I'm calling sparse matrix vector multiply k times. It's a really big matrix, it doesn't fit in cache. I've got to read it from DRAM to cache k times, so my cost is proportional to k, my communication cost. For the new algorithm, I can take k steps of the algorithm and only move the matrix once from memory. I mean, one is a lower bound. I've got to touch the matrix once, but I can take k steps of the algorithm, so potentially I can go k times faster. What about the parallel case? Again, imagine I take k steps of the algorithm, I've got to talk to my neighbors k times, I've got to do k dot products, reductions, stuff like that. And so again, the communication cost is going to grow proportional to k. The new algorithm is, again, independent of how many steps I take. Log p, one reduction. Can't do better than that. And so there's, again, lots of speed up possible, measured and, and modeled. And the price we're going to pay is we're going to do some extra flops. But flops are cheap, so who cares? So let me just show you at a very high level what the old algorithm looks like and what the new one does. So here is one of these standard algorithms. I'm going to do, take k steps. In the inner loop, I'm going to do a, a matrix vector multiply, my sparse matrix times a vector. I'm going to run an algorithm called modified Gram-Schmidt, which does lots of dot products and Saxby's and, and so forth, to make this vector orthogonal to the previous ones. And then I do some scalar stuff, which is cheap. OK, and then I solve a little least squares problem with this little tiny matrix at the end. That's, that's, but the big cost is all these sparse matrix vector multiplies and all these dot products and Saxby's. Here's what the new algorithm does. In one step, I can compute not just one matrix vector product, I can compute all of these. A, V, A, V, A squared, V, up to A to the K, V. And I only have to touch the matrix A once, if you're clever. Now, what do I do once I get all those vectors? I need to make them orthogonal. And I'm going to call that algorithm I just told you about, the tall, skinny QR, which does this QR factorization with as little communication as possible. Then all the rest of the algebra has to change, too. I won't tell you how, but in the sequential case, you know, the number of times I have to touch all the data goes down by a factor of k, I win big. And in the parallel case, the number of messages, the latency cost, also decreases by a factor of k. So everything I've told you is an exact mathematical transformation. If I were doing exact arithmetic, I'd get the right answer. But if you're a numerical person, and I am, you realize this program has a bug, a numerical bug. And that's because all of these, I'm running the page rank algorithm, if you remember what that is. 
All of these vectors are getting more and more nearly parallel to one another. They're a terrible basis of vectors, and I lose precision. So, but let me run an experiment, just see what happens. So I'm going to take a matrix. I'm going to run the algorithm. Here's the iteration number. Here is the log of the residual. I want the residual to get small. The black line is the classical algorithm, the slow one. It converges. That's fine. The new one, the blue dots, doesn't converge at all because it's totally numerically unstable. So, but I have a big design space to choose from. I did not see, I showed, this is what I computed. I computed AX, A squared X, A cubed X. It turns out I can choose any polynomials I like. And if I'm a clever numerical person, I pick the right polynomials, it converges just fine. So to get these new algorithms to work, you've got to get the computer science right, and you've got to get the numerical analysis right. So here's some speed up numbers from SC09. Um, there's a different, these are lots of different practical matrices from you know, simulating various things in the world. And this bar is the time it takes to run the old algorithm, normalized to be one, and uh, the, the speed. And this new bar, so, sorry, th this bar is the new algorithm, normalized to time one, and this taller bar is the old algorithm, the slow one, right? So this bar is 2.3 times higher than that, so we get a speed up of 2.3, 2.1, 1.7. And the numbers are, what k did we choose? That's a tuning parameter. We, choose it, we chose it to minimize communication. Where do the colors come from? The colors tell you where I, when, if I was doing, how much time was spent doing dense linear algebra versus sparse linear algebra. And depending on the problem, you did more dense or more sparse. It depends on your sparse matrix. But both of them shrank considerably, and you had to get them both fast to get, get this to work. When we first did this, we had one group, one team making, tuning the dense linear algebra, trying to get that to go as fast as possible. We had a different team tuning the sparse stuff. Then we put them together, and it was terrible. It, was, it slowed down. Why was that? Because they were fighting one another for the cache. Then we realized what we had to do is we had to do what we call co-tuning. We had to tune these two subroutines, knowing that you were going to call them alternating, first one, then the other, and back and forth, so they wouldn't fight the cache. And so, designing these kinds of algorithms is not a trivial thing. It's something that we want to automate. So here, sorry, this doesn't show up. This is, again, the exascale machine, predicted speed ups, um, anywhere from factors of five to factors of nine by doing this particular optimization on a special sparse matrix that comes up. OK, so I really am almost done here. So here's a summary of iterative linear algebra. Again, new lower bounds, optimal algorithms, big speed ups in theory and practice. Um, we have lots of ongoing work. Um, there are a lot of different algorithms people use in practice. So I showed you GM res, there's conjugate gradients, there's Bicy G stab, there's Lanchos and Arnoldi. There's an alphabet soup of these algorithms we're working on. We're, we also have architectural scaling rules for the direct case. They're a little bit harder to state. They kind of depend on your sparse matrix structure. And so you'll have to wait until we get that written up. Um, and again, we're going to use auto-tuning to ex explore the design space. So, to finish up, if you want to find further information, you can go to my webpage. We have a, you know, lots of papers there. I taught a one-week short course on this last summer. And if you, as I said, Google Parallel Computing course, either number, the number one course or the number two course are both ours, and there's a lot of material on this. Uh, so the summary is that it's time to redesign everything, all of linear algebra, and eventually the rest of applied mathematics. We have ideas about all the other things you might want to do. And the one thing that's going to tie it all together that's going to make it all work is we don't communicate. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, James. Do we have any questions? Uh, two quick questions. Uh, Yaya Mirza from Aurora Boreal Software. Uh, first question is, given the whole industry is pretty much set on uh, shared memory and coherency, and given that uh, a lot of the kind of things you can do with linear algebra, especially with uh, solvers, is do uh, cache conscious, because you're more, uh, you're more sensitive to the memory than you are to compute, right? Uh, what's your take on that? Do you think they're all wrong? We've implemented these things on um, local store architectures. Uh, cell, for example, we've implemented them on, you know, on architectures where the, cat, where the hardware keeps it coherent for you. We can make it work in both places. The, the tuning structure is different, which is why we try to automate the process. The big, one of the biggest obstacles has been NUMA. We have to take that into account very carefully so that whatever jobs we assign to one core, you know, the data is stored, so you minimize communication to the, to the distant DRAM. So far, we've been doing a lot of this by hand, we're, but we're in the process of automating it. So anything that 
you do to simplify the tuning space would help, but on the other hand, we've sort of accepted that it's only going to get arbitrarily more complicated, <laughs> and our job is to, in some sense, create a database of optimizations, and whenever a new architecture comes out, just go through it, it grows every year, and try them all. But no, no preference between the two? Between local, cache coherent, non-cache coherent? Yeah, local store style versus uh, cached, uh, you know, I much coherent. prefer caches, just, they're much easier, but I think I'm going to, I think that's a longer conversation mm -hmm. to actually go back and look at what we had to do, for example, on cell versus, you know, Cloverton, Nehalem, et cetera. The second question is, uh, given that every sparse is like, uh, you know, when you do your sparse matrix vector multiply, you get a cache miss every time. Do you have any, you know, your thoughts on fixing that problem so we don't... Well, like well we do blocking, you know, in all, at all levels of the cache hierarchy, but the one that makes it work really well is this A to the K business. So when we bring in you know, our sparse matrix, we reuse it over and over, we reuse it k times in order to compute, I didn't show you all the dependency graphs, but we reuse it k times to avoid those cache misses. That's where that factor k comes in of how many steps I take. That's where I get the reuse from. Thank you. Okay, one more question. Hi, uh, Bob Stewart, Stewart Research. Um, I'm curious what category of problems arise in both governmental and non-governmental problems that uh, bring forth the need for this category of calculation. Well, sparse matrices come up absolutely everywhere. In my, you know, my uh, course slides, I show pictures of many matrices that people use, uh, depending on your way of life. For example, at Slack, we have sparse matrices from Slack, which is local, where they're designing particle accelerators. That's a very small user base. We also have finite element matrices that come from you know, many design industries. That's a much larger user base. And I also show them the Google matrix in PageRank, right, which has a very large user base, right? So you can find the sparse matrices do come up in many different walks of life. So, and, and if you look at the department, so when you say government versus, versus industry, we have this uh, Par Lab at Berkeley, which you may have heard about. We have looked at many different uh, applications from both commercial and scientific, and we divided them up into different patterns that appear over and over again. And one of them is sparse linear algebra. Another one is dense linear algebra, graph algorithms. There's a list of them. And, and I can assure you that both dense and sparse linear algebra appear many times in both commercial and scientific applications. But we have a very long technical report on that that I can refer you to. And, and one of the co-authors is right in front of you, right there. So. <laughs> All right, thanks, James. Okay. Thank you. Okay, before we do our, another, our next presentation, I have a quick announcement. Um, there is a Black Olympus MP3 recorder that was left here in the auditorium. Um, if you see that, um, please take that to the front. It's somewhere, I think, in this front uh, section in the center. Um, it, that, that was left, and the person who left it had to leave. So if you do see that, please take it to the front desk. Um, our next presentation is um, from Microsoft, and we'll cover a very interesting interactive system that Many of us are in, oftentimes, I guess our kids are quite familiar with, the Xbox Connect. Um, we actually have two presenters for this talk, um, uh, Scott McEldoni and Dawson Yi. Uh, Scott is the principal opt optical engineer for the Connect hardware system. He's been at Microsoft for three years and working in the development of natural user interface technologies based on gesture recognition. And he's worked on 18 years before that on advanced optical technology at 3DSU. He has an MS degree in mechanical engineering and a PhD in optical science. And uh, Dawson is the Connect Hardware Systems Engineering Architect. And he's been at Microsoft for over 13 years. And prior to that, worked at Intel for over 10 years. So Dawson. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity for us to present and talk about the unforeseen challenges that the whole team had to overcome to bring Connect to market. Uh, I don't know if many of you know, but we actually have a big, extensive hardware team at Microsoft. And, and I'm holding my notes here because this is the first time we've ever talked outside of Microsoft to the level of degree about the hardware in Connect. Uh, there's a lot of untold and non-obvious challenges. And, and you know, even the product teardowns haven't really got to the subtleties of it, nobody. 
not even our manufacturers, our suppliers, or our vendors are gonna see the, the, the level of detail and the number of topics that we're talking about today that, that you're gonna to get to see. We have a lot of slides, a lot of topics, but at the end of the presentation, you're gonna understand and, and see that everything we talk about is important. In fact, every topic we're gonna to discuss, the reason why there's so many slides is we would not have shipped the product if we did not solve every single one of these issues. So let's move on. So in, t in terms of, oops, okay, that's next one. So if you look at really the Connect product, you, you sort of think of it as just a, a, a 3D depth engine, video, and audio. Taken alone, yes, that's true. Uh, the 3D imaging is brand new. The array microphone is brand new. But as soon as you try to put all three together, you run into issues. Scott will talk a little bit later on about when you put the video and in, in 3D depth together, that causes alignment issues. And that alignment has to be held with, within pixels because if you think about it, the RGB and the depth are gonna be used together. And over the life of the product, those have to be maintained. And now you have audio, that's an array microphone, and that has to be brought together with the 3D. The 3D engine actually generates a lot of heat. And heat, you know, in order to solve the thermal problem, usually means a cooling system. Cooling system means fan. Fan means bad for audio. And, and if that wasn't bad enough, we also had to, as soon as you dig deeper, it's a new user space, right? These are new, there's new requirements that we talk about. When we talk about play space, that's where the user stands, right? For a normal RGB system, low light is the problem, and in for our, our 3D depth system, the ambient light is the problem because it's, we're, we're, we're sensing a near IR. So that's, that's a whole new, new set of problems. And clothing, because again, we're in near infrared. So these pants may not appear as black and near infrared, and this shirt may not appear as, as bright and near infrared. So it's a whole new space of problems that no one had to work on before. So in terms of design considerations, it's a V1 product. The category did not exist before we launched. And, and on our initial launch, we wanted to go after a new demographic. These were non-gamers, non-technical people, families, people who traditionally do not play video games or do not bring technology into their home. We had no reference data about the people. We, we didn't know who they were, where they would place it, or how they would place it. And it actually caused a lot of problems. So actually what we did was we had our user experience team fly around the world interview people, bring up mock units that they wanted to see them take it out of the box, and of course most people just threw away the user and set up manuals right away. We, we found out where they wanted to place it. We had a demo game. I know if some of you remember that rally ball game, you may have seen some demos on it. We actually had them play that, and it was, there, there's some really interesting videos because some people would, would crawl over their couches and try to move back, and they were, they didn't know where to place the unit. And so those videos really helped us a lot in, term, in determining how to make the product so that it just, it's just magic, that technology is just there. When the user plugs it in, it sets up and it just works. Um, and the other problem too that we had as des hardware designers in the group was that we knew that the rally ball was not the future application. As you see today, there's lots of people who are using it for different applications that we didn't even think of, let alone the game and the exercise video. We never even thought about that at the time, but we knew that the hardware has to be extensible. The software can be upgradable, but the hardware had to be extensible for future uses. So at Microsoft, we also have the, the standard regulatory stuff. We do the FCC, EMI, uh, CE mark, ESD, and all that kind of stuff. But we go, for a Microsoft product, we usually, we always go beyond. We have extensive power on testing, power, power cycles, humidity, drop, test, uh, temperature cycling. Uh, we're, we're also concerned about, you know, when I talk about hotspots here, what we're talking about is the plastics. These are consumers who are gonna be using this new technology. If they sense a hotspot on the plastics, they're gonna, we're gonna get service calls. And in fact, in some of our beta testing, we actually, some, some, some Microsoft users said, I think this unit's getting too hot. And we actually said, no, that's actually in spec. So we do worry about that level of, uh, level of detail. And of course, user abuse. I know for a fact that you can drop this on concrete, you can sit on it, you can throw it in a backpack. I don't, you know, I don't want you to do that, but you should know that the product works after doing that. And this is the level of detail that we put into the product to make it robust so that users have a great experience. So design tech. So the problem is, how do you go about designing something you don't know who's gonna use it, how they're gonna use it, and where they're gonna use it? Luckily for us, it's hardware, right? So it's always based on physics, right? We know the materials. We know a schedule constraint. Uh, we know what could be manufactured today. And 
I put cost as, as a target, right? We didn't really hit the cost goals, but we hit the target. So we have some flexibility there. And, and what might be surprising to you is the approach. We did it a work by design approach. We went, Scott and I, and, and the rest of the team, we went, we went to physics, we went to fundamental principles. What is the material is, is going to allow us, right? What is, wh what is the max min, what are, what, are, what are the four corners, the max min type of design, right? Some people, you know, could, could accuse us of over designing because most people will never see a max min condition. I know in chip design, we always do max min condition and four corner testing, but in system design, a lot of people don't because you, you argue, well, what's the probability of someone hitting this temperature at this high voltage at this corner condition with the silicon? But this is what we did in the Connect, and this is why we believe it works so well today. And we, you know, the user return rates have been extremely low. And, 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 and so again, right, you can say it's over-designed, or you can say it's a robust design. So if you look at the system overview, I think a lot of you have seen teardowns in the, uh, on, on websites, if, if you look, everything is it's pretty compact. Everything's fixed and routed, but if you but the reason but it's quite deliberate. Okay, if it, it's really meant for design for assembly, and the way the people on the assembly line they, they like to have things in in flow, and they don't like to blind assemble. So everything is deliberate with the way it is. All the connectors, all the way the wires are routed. There's acoustic implications. There's thermal implications. And each of those are designed for a purpose. And e even, even the mechanical dimples that you see there, those are for a purpose. And the way it's assembled, those are for a purpose too. Everything is purposeful in the design. Uh, so if we look at an exploded view, I think some of you may have seen this before. We actually have three printed circuit board assembly. There's, there's what we call a camera board, an audio board, and a motor board. And what this allowed us to do is concurrent design. It was a new design, totally from the ground up. It's a new team. People haven't worked together before. So what this allowed us everyone to do is iterate and independently do their own designs and, and, and do whatever they needed to do to meet the product goals. We had a consistent set of product goals that everybody had to meet and everybody worked concurrently together. And when it all came together, I mean, that's the product you have today, it just works. Uh, Let's see, and also, actually not shown here, is actually, you know, there's electrical, firmware, mechanical, optical, audio, and acoustics. So this is kind of the meat, this is a lot of speculation as to what's inside the box, and I'll, this is kind of, you know, you're gonna hear it right now. There's a PrimeSense uh, ASIC here, and this is uh, very purposeful for the depth engine. Uh, Scott will talk about it later. It projects a pattern out, and it comes back on the IR sensor, and that determines the depth. And in terms of data streams, it, everything talks across USB 2 to the console. Uh, the RGB sensor is just another data stream that goes there as well, and everything is an ISOC pipe. We have an audio process here, and that's what the Marvell is running. I'll talk about that later. It's got some DDR memory, and it's running echo cancellation and beam forming. And it's also local power management. And we have a, a, a TI motor controller, and it also does some motor control. What's not shown here are some of the sideband signals, like uh, we, have, we have things like for watchdog, thermal recovering, and, and power control. But fundamentally, every, everything talks, talks to the host via USB streams, and again, that allowed us to do our concurrent engineering. So, let's see. So Scott, I think you're up now. Okay, so. So what I'm going to talk about is the overall depth design, the sensors that, uh, that allow us to create the 3D image. So what the, uh, what the depth is, is we have an infrared projector, and it's combined with the CMOS sensor system, uh, sensor camera, that allows us to see the room in 3D. It's been well established that the principle that this works on is structured light. And the way to think about structured light, at the basics, it's a triangulation method. But what we do is, is we illuminate a pattern generator, and that pattern generator go ahead, creates a pattern in the target area in which we want to measure the depth. And then we, what we do is we create an image of that, of that pattern, or basically a distorted image, the distortion with respect to a reference image. And from that, we can calculate what the depth is. So there's two key aspects of that. One is the IR sensor, and the other is, is the near-infrared projector. The IR sensor, the key to this is we have a very high sensor responsivity, and this allows us to reduce the optical power consumption. The optical power budget is a very critical part of this that allows us to maintain signal-to-noise. We also need a very large FOV 
field of view in the camera system to maximize the play space. But at the same time, we have to make sure this has very low distortion. Distortion can cause depth errors in the system, which are hard to correct for. And we have to have a high modulation transfer function, or think of that as the contrast ratio of the, uh, of the image that we're trying to create. We also put a narrow bandpass filter in this, and this allows us to block out the ambient light from things like sunlight or, uh, or other halogen or other type of incandescent light sources. The, one of the most critical parts of this is the infrared projector, and the key to that is this IR laser system. So the IR laser is an indium gallium arsenite laser that's similar to what might be found in a telecommunication system on OPU. However, a lot of the considerations we had to have on these are very extreme. The temperature control has to be to fractions of a second because we're trying to match the wavelength of this laser to the narrow bandpass filter. We have to worry about over temperature, we have to worry about whether or not, we have to worry about holding this temperature over the operating range, and we have to get it stabilized within the boot time of the system. We have to worry about things like mode hopping, which is basically the cavity change in the, in the laser cavity, which can cause a sudden change in wavelength. We have to worry about feedback from the other optics, which can cause instability. We have to worry about ramping and transients. And probably most important in this thing is we have to worry about the reliability. We have things like catastrophic optical damage, which will suddenly cause the laser to fail. And so we have to worry about the drive circuits and make sure that we don't overpower them. And we have to make sure that the laser, we can guarantee its reliability. So another key aspect of this is the radiometric design. The key metric for this, usually in a radiometric design, is the signal to noise ratio. And the key noise factor that we had to worry about is the ambient light. We also had to worry, consider the quantum efficiency of the, the sensor. And this is basically the responsivity in terms of amps generated versus optical power, uh, optical watts of power in. We had to consider the near versus far range, so someone that's up close versus someone who's gonna stand further away. And the amount of power you get back to, uh, to the sensor would, would change as one over the distance square. We also had to consider what happens at the corners of the field of view versus the center, because this also drops off as a cosine, cosine to the fourth factor. We had to worry about the different reflectivities of objects, things like you know, a person standing close with a white shirt that might saturate a sensor, or someone that might stand further back in a black, uh, in a, in a black uh, clothing, which might limit the amount of energy that gets back. We had to worry about the minimum object size and the resolution, because the resolution tends to drive us to smaller sensor sizes, but we had to make sure we had enough power, so we had to make sure that the area of the sensors were big enough. And then lastly, the contrast of the imaging system, which reduces the overall signal to noise. Then we have this narrow bandpass filter, which allows us to block undesired ambient light, but we also need to make sure that we can guarantee that we pass the illumination wavelength. So there was always a, a trade-off between how wide do we make the filter versus how manufacturable the system is. And then we had to consider all the incident angles. This, is a, this has a cone of angles that comes in from the optics, and we have a very wide field of view, and these bandpass filters, these optical bandpass filters, can change dramatically in their properties over, over different angles of incidence. So this is a layout of the, uh, the optical system that we have. You can see the projector here, we have the IR sensor right here, and then we have an RGB sensor right here. And the key to this is that we have to maintain registration of the registration or alignment between all three of these modules, and we have to hold it very, very tightly. A key thing is, is number one, this was an all-module design, so that these modules could be blind assembled in the assembly line to make sure that this was very low cost. But the modules had to be designed such that we could guarantee that any module that we could manufacture would work well with the other modules. We also had to make sure that the, the alignment stayed, uh, uh, stayed accurate through all, all, uh, all conditions. So we, did this, so we did this through the use of a, uh, a uh, optical bench here or a subframe. And, uh, and then we, we position these through the use of screw bosses in order to be, be able to maintain the precision, precision alignment. <clears throat> and then, of course, the key, accuracy, the key aspect of this is, uh, is the depth. We have to be able to measure the depth accurate, accurately. And one of the ways we do this is we calibrate the system before we, uh, before we ship it, of course. So at time zero, we know that we have good accuracy. But then we have to hold that accuracy over a bunch of conditions. And we knew that this is considered to be a toy, so we know it's going to be abused. And so we have to guarantee uniformity across the field of view, temperature, time, shake, drop, anything you can think of. And the thing that Dawson mentioned about holding alignment, this is very critical, because structured light principle is used to measure the shift in the alignment to the subpixel level. And subpixels means that we have to hold micron level tolerances. And these micron level tolerances need to be held in the presence of drop, uh, 
drop, uh, thermal cycles, shipping conditions, if this thing has to sit in Vietnam for, you know, for so many weeks under very extreme conditions. We have metals and plastics which are used in the design. We have changes in the optics, and of course the thing that scares me the most is the unintended stresses that we don't know that might potentially exist and, and could cause issues. Great, thanks. Let's talk a little bit more about the audio system. Uh, there's three types of speech that matter to the Connect. One is speech commands, such that when you're talking to the Connect, you say Xbox Connect, Xbox Next, Xbox Previous, or even when you're watching, a, say, a Netflix movie. There's game chat. During a game play, you're talking to your buddy hands-free. And then the last one is video conferencing, such as Video Connect, which is full duplex audio conferencing. Uh, what we have is we have four microphones. Each one is, is running its own separate acoustic echo canceller inside the, the Marvell processor and it's echo canceling the 5.1 digital audio. What's not shown here is the console is outputting that 5.1 audio on your speakers. And so it's running four instances of acoustic echo canceler, one for each microphone, and each microphone's coming in at 16K samples at 24 bits. The reason why we do 24 bits is because someone standing at 0.8 meters talking really loud is gonna have one loudness, and then someone standing at 3.5 meters quietly is, is going to be at a much lower level. So we, it's not that we needed 24 bits, but we actually needed a dynamic range in the audio, uh, on, the, on the audio digital converters. Uh, so let's see. And after the AEC, we actually do a beam forming. So what actually the beam forming does is it enhances, it, it actually enhances the signal to noise ratio of the speaker because again, someone talking 3.5 meters away in a quiet voice is gonna be competing against the noise, whether it's during gameplay or ambient noise in the room. Uh, and uh, the output of the beamformer is a single channel of clean audio at 16K samples per second at 16 bits. The 5.1 digital audio is actually coming in at 48K samples at 16, at 16 bits. So the, a lot of challenges here that we ran the AEC on a local processor because of, mainly because of latency. And you, for those of you who have ever done AEC, you know that you need a tight loop here. And the subtlety that you may not understand is that this 5.1 digital audio has to be synchronous with the source from the console. So all these samples that are being done here have to be have the frequency and phase locked to the source that's coming off the Xbox console. And of course, it's all coming across USB. And again, for beamforming to work, these microphone elements have to be matched within dBs as built. We don't, we don't do any kind of cherry picking. We, for lowest cost, we have to take what we get. And of course, the, the AC has to be run before the beamformer to work, otherwise it's, it's always gonna be chasing. Um, a big issue here that you may not, that I touched on earlier was fan noise. So Scott's talking about the laser diode having to be maintained at a certain temperature and it's got inefficiencies. It's generating a lot of heat inside the box. And so what we have to do is we have to get the heat out of the system and the lowest cost method to do that is with a fan. You know, ideally we would like noiseless cooling. And so what's happening is a quiet talker at say three or three and a half meters is gonna be competing against a fan in the same enclosure, buzzing away. So that presented a huge challenge for us in the audio to get it working, um, the, especially for, for speech and, for, you know, and games and so on, because when that fan is going, it's really loud. So I mentioned earlier too about the user setup. You know, we went to, we had the videos in different people's houses. What we found out was people, where they placed the unit, it was not consistent. They didn't know how to set it up. And they would go up, put it, tilt it up and down, and move back and iterative back and forth. Now, a lot of people don't know that for Connect, you can actually manually pan and tilt it itself. So what we did was Wow. Okay, uh, we, we, we put the tilt motor in there because we found out the help in user setup. When they took it out of the box, they just placed it on the shelf. What happens on initially out of the box setup is if you've ever run the tuner on Connect, it actually looks for the floor every time you do it. It actually turns on, it looks for the floor. Once it knows the floor, it knows gravity is gonna win every time and the user's gonna be standing there. And so, and, and so that, uh, that really helped a lot on the out of box experience because otherwise people would sit there and like I said, go up and uh, go back and forth and move the tilt back and forth. And it also allows short players and, and tall players to play simultaneously. Um, we don't have shaft encoders on the, on, the, on the mechanical, so actually we have an accelerometer built onto the printed circuit board, and that tells us when, 
when the command comes in, it's, it's a command for the motor to move. And we look at the accelerometer feedback loop to tell us how far we've moved, and that, and that works the loop back. And of course, we have all sorts of, you know, how fast, how fast we move, how accurate it is. Um, and the problem with the motor, motor is just really horrible on, on power draw. We actually have uh, peak versus RMS power in the system, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes later on. Uh, gear trains wear out, and motors make noise, and of course, we do shut off the audio when, it's, when the motor's tilting. So mechanical structure, industrial design. Uh, good ID is you'll see it when you know it, and bad ID is you'll see it when you know it, but it's hard to describe. It's really about what does it look like. Now this is, a, we wanted to come up with one skew of the product, one piece of plastic that people would be willing to put in their living room. It's gonna be front and center every time you see it. It can't dominate, it can't look junky, and it can't look overbearing. So if you look closely at it, you will not see any screws up front. You won't see any plastic seams up front. It looks kind of, you know, it kind of blends in and, and, and it just works. And if you notice, you don't even see the microphones. Those are hidden from view. So what's shown to the user, what they see every day, is what was absolutely necessary. Um, and, and Scott also talked about, you know, holding the mechanical optical tolerances and, and, the, and, we, and the thermal issues are, are really a bear in this design. Uh, robustness. What's not obvious in design are all the all the safeguards and recovery that we put in there for the product, whether people don't have to know the underlying technology, it just has to work. If you get an ESD strike, it has to recover. If someone throws a cloth over it and it overheats, it has to shut down gracefully and then come back next time to life. Uh, the other problem too is that we had limited power availability into it. We had to work from the existing Xboxes and we also had to do 360S. Some of you don't know this, but we actually sell an extender cable. And that caused us a problem for the motor. Remember I told you the motor is notorious for peak versus RMS. If a motor stalls, it, create, it sucks a lot of current. What we can't have is during a motor stall to have a unit reset itself due to a power brownout. So it was very important for us to get our power budgets clean and designed for worst case versus RMS type power. Uh, transient immunity, this is, a, this is an interesting one just to tell you robustness. Um, we wanted to make sure that this thing would last and last and last. What we did was we used a lightning and surge simulator, which you normally you run for 1,000 cycles. We ran it for days on the, on the system. We wanted to see if any surges or any kind of um, lightning strikes would damage the system. We ran it for days, and of course, we didn't find any issues. So we feel pretty good about the reliability of that. Um, another trade-off with the power, too, is we could have went with a bigger cable, but then that causes us to have you know, a stronger motor because now it's, it's harder to bend the cable and which causes more, more power draw. So there was a really, a lot of, lot, of, lot of design elements that we had to go through. So, you know, you gotta question yourself, how many times is someone gonna get a worst case motor with the worst case gear train, with the worst case power load, and then you gotta ask yourself, are you over designing or are you designing for great UX, for user experience? Uh, test. Uh, this was a totally new product. No one had ever done this before. No one knew how to test it. No one knew what does it mean to four corner test depth. How do you how do you temperature chamber test acoustics? You can't get an anechoic chamber at 40 degrees C to do thermal testing. Uh, even even the temperature chambers that we put uh, the units into that that airflow caused problems for us because we the acoustics would pick it up or it would, it would mess up our thermal testing because when the fan was off, we expected zero airflow, but when the thermal chambers, as some of you use them know, they actually create air turbulence. Um, so the other challenge that we actually came across was actually supply chain. Some of the suppliers we used were never used to consumer level volumes, and some of the suppliers were never used to the level of reliability. So we were accused of you know, asking for telecom quality at consumer price points but we knew that the users had to be delighted when they get the product. Can't have any failures, it's gotta last a long time, it's just gotta work. And so there's a lot of suppliers that were kinda of caught off guard, and I'll give you an example too. Scott mentioned some optical components. You gotta hold the components. Because we have two optical systems and they have to hold alignment, they never thought about that. You, you take a webcam or a cell phone, if you lose alignment, you just move it yourself, right? If it tilts, you just move it yourself. In this case, we have two optical elements that are mounted permanently forever. They have to hold alignment. You can't refocus it. You can't move one versus the other. They gotta hold it forever. And this is the kind of, this is the kind of design that we needed to hold in. Like Scott said, it's gotta hold micron level of precision over temperature. There's no recalibration and, and, and drop testing and abuse and shipping. So our, so our last slide here is just um, acknowledgement. A lot of 
a lot of new processes had to be invented to make the product, uh, would not have happened if we didn't push it because the industry would have just continued on. We had to invent a lot of new processes. We had to use new materials that were new to us. Um, so just a couple years back, the technology that we used for Connect wouldn't have existed. And so Scott and I thank all of our coworkers, our suppliers and vendors and customers for successful product. I'd like to thank uh, John Sell in the audience for introducing us to Hot Chips to have us the opportunity to talk here. And, and I hope that you, know, you all have a better understanding and appreciation of the hardware design of the Connect hardware product. Thank you. Thanks, Dawson and Scott. Come back up here, Scott. Um, questions? Hi, I'm Dave Brown from the Solaris Engineering Group at, at Sun. Um, well, I understand it's a hardware conference, so I hope you'll forgive this question, but um, and it may not be one that you, you guys will answer, but uh, I think something that is maybe provocative about this as well is to talk a little bit about what the um, programmatic abstractions are that are associated with this sort of small distributed sensing device that you've built. So I'm going to sort of invite you to give a corresponding talk at an, an appropriate conference about sort of what the software development model looks like related to this, maybe the interfaces between the game console and the, and the box that you've built, and or whether you might have things to say about sort of broader de software development consequences given these sorts of... Um, right, so, so we're, we're from the hardware team, right? And, and there's a, Microsoft's a software company, there's, there's a whole bunch of people working on, on SDKs. You're aware of that, right? Really great. Are there some? Are, are those guys out giving talks about what the? I'm not sure if they're giving talks, but there actually is a is a, a SDK available now. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So okay. one thing I would I would add um, in terms of the challenges that we had, since this is the first very high volume uh, 3D imaging system. I mean, at the volumes that we're at. I mean, it was a. It, I mean, in terms of challenges, it was it was challenging to know what the tolerances needed to be of the system versus how that would correspond to the to the performance that a consumer or the software really needed. And that, that's an evolutionary thing. It wasn't, that was a huge challenge in terms of, okay, how, how accurate does this need to be in order to guarantee a good user experience? We had to over-design because we knew that there'd be more applications coming. So. That's right. And, and then, so in, in terms of number of usable pixels and all that other stuff, it was, a, it was quite a challenge. If you do a web search for, for Connect SDK, I'm sure it'll show up at Microsoft. Okay, great. It's, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, quick question. Um, how long has the Connect been in development? Like when Project Natal was announced, how far uh, were you guys in producing it? Let's see, I've been. So I think um, in terms of from the day, I mean, the, the, the technology of structured light and time of flight and stuff like that, that's been in development for many, many years. But in terms of when it started to be productized, it was. I want to say it was about, uh, I think it was about 18 months from the day we started to the day we actually started, man went to release to manufacturing. And second question, it seems as if the heat issue is a recurring problem with some of Xbox products. Is this, you know, probably an ongoing uh, tradition or just a legacy of No, it's all about hot chips. <laughs> <laughs> we, we needed, we were actually, that's what's ironic, right? We were looking for the cooler chips, the, the Marvel processor we used. You know, we, we needed to be AC. We didn't need the fastest. We just needed something. But but I think heat is is the bane of all all designers, right? And and we nailed on this one. Believe me, it's solid. Works by design. Min max. Thank you. Last question. Yeah, um, I know the Connect is starting to be used in non-game applications with the SDK, and I'm curious, what do you consider to be the most innovative or interesting non-game applications that you've heard of for uh, Connect? No, it's a, I mean, there's a lot of opinions on that. I, I personally, I like the idea of telepresence in terms of being able to, uh, you know, maybe able to uh, to look back and forth and be able to see, you know, create a telepresence type of system. Certainly, a lot of technologies will need to be developed in terms of being able to do that. But I, I mean, I've, you know, you see stuff at at, uh, at various universities where people are kind of now instead of having to create, you know, very complex holographic systems of a person, now they can use the Connect and get almost there and. St and, uh, and start to create you know, real-time 3D, 3D images of someone. Yeah, personally, I like, you know, if you see the demo Nordstrom's window when they were, they were drawing on the window, that was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. And then the medical one, right? I was like, how come I didn't think of that? Well, I was too busy designing the product, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, I think it's we have time for. Um, so, 
Or? Very, very quick. Okay. Very, very quick. Uh, I know Microsoft had to buy a few other things. I guess you know they bought 3 dv systems. I kind of wondered why all of that took place. If you had the Prime Sense uh, technology already. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the end, in the end, each technology. I mean, like anything else, each technology has its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, structured light is a, is a great technology. Time of flight is a great technology, and basically, it's something so that now we have the ability to basically apply the right solution to the right problem. Because I don't know that there, I don't know, and this is me being very honest. I don't know that there's a complete solution to 3D imaging yet that uh, that solves every problem that could be out there. Okay. Thanks again, to our speakers. Thanks.